the drive through a symbol of America's capitalist invention now being used to process its millions of unemployed. Florida's online benefit system crashed under the demand. So too in Arkansas, where people are risking their health to come in person to the unemployment office. And then when you go and try to apply, you can't get through. So that's why I'm standing down here in line to go see them face to face. As unemployed Americans feel they have no choice but to reject White House advice and physically apply for help, the president is suggesting this will all be over soon. We're hopefully uh, heading toward a final stretch, the light at the end of the tunnel. Try telling that to the frontline health workers of New York City. It's really challenging. I mean, yesterday I worked 16 hours and I had 13 cardiac arrests. Um, that's a lot of death. A record 799 of them in the state yesterday. Nurses used to working in the worst of situations say they could never have imagined what they're now witnessing. There are also a plethora of people who are just incredibly sick in a way that I've never experienced or seen before. And it's awful to be able to offer them so minimum uh, of things. Um, so every day is, is honestly the hardest day. That anxiety is not lost on the state's governor. His daily briefings as much about bolstering morale as imparting information. We're in a battle, right? But this is about a war. And we're only on one battle here. Even once we get through this battle, we have to stay prepared for what could come down the road. Uh, and we also have to start to repair the immense damage. Before you start talking about restarting the economy, Another necessity, a vaccine. That race continues apace, but, but scientists say a widely available treatment is still at least a year away, suggesting America's streets may be empty for much longer than the president predicts. Well, earlier I spoke to Dr. Sian Ferrer, who is currently working as an emergency physician in New York, but she also served as a medic in Iraq. I began by asking her, what she's seeing in the hospital she's now deployed in. What we see every day is overwhelming. Uh, you walk into the emergency department, usually you have a waiting room outside the street with normal cars, but now the street is filled with uh, tents that are seeing patients and our waiting rooms have changed into a makeshift emergency room. And our emergency department, when you walk into the hallway, you see people on oxygen, um, it feels like you're in ICU because you see a lot of patients on a ventilator because they can't breathe on their own. Dr. Ferrer, you are used to uh, the front line. You were in Iraq. How does this contrast with a military medical operation? Do, do, is this the poor relation? Yes. You know, I've never seen this much dead in one day except when I was in Iraq. And that I felt like I was more prepared for it because it was an active war zone. And to see a lot of patients dying is something that you expect and you mentally prepare for. But to see this here in New York City, where um, you would at least expect to be practicing advanced medicine with resources. And it's not only an active war zone, but it feels like it fighting against the virus. The humanity component of it is almost gone because you're not having that touch. Everything is through mask and through personal protective equipment. You would have to tell family members, say, I'm sorry, I can't let you see your mother or your father while they're dying. But I'll promise you that I'll be by their side and make them comfortable. This feels unbelievably hard on you on the nurses, on the other doctors, on all the orderlies. I mean, how do you deal with the stress? Some of us, including myself, have fallen ill due to this disease. And um, I also brought it home and uh, my husband also fell ill. And having to fight the disease, me as, um, as a patient this time around, and the issue with getting tested because testing was not abundantly available for most of us. What we told patients are, if you don't need to come to the hospital because you need oxygen or because you need to be 
on a ventilator don't come, stay at home. And when they do come, and if they look fine or stable, I've sent them home without testing just because we just didn't have enough testing for everyone. So me being on the other side and saying and getting that answer, hey, your symptoms are not severe enough, so just stay home and take care of yourself and no, we won't test you. That for me was such a shocker because here I am in the front line and um, being told I being told that I couldn't get tested at the time when I felt ill, I felt so unappreciated and felt so defeated from the whole process. But as we speak now, Dr. Ferreo, there is no obvious end in sight. And I'm wondering how long you can put up, how long you can cope with this stress. We know that um, it's going to be a few more weeks before New York and all of the state can go back to normal. And there might even be a few more months. I'm hopeful that, you know, in the next six to eight weeks that the numbers are going to start declining. Uh, the plateau might be a few more weeks again. But I think uh, it's just really with the glimpse of hope and with the amount of support that we get from family members, from friends. And some of the things that me and my colleagues talk about are like this every day at 7 p.m. All of New York City goes out to the window and are clapping, showing their appreciation for the frontline providers. I found it very helpful and very uplifting and, and encouraging. It's such those heartwarming moments and makes us very honored to do the things that we do every day.